Next up, we will have Dr. Kershaw Patel, who is an assistant professor of cardiology here at the Houston Methodist Academic Institute. He also serves as the director of the Cardiometabolic Health Program. His interests include cardiovascular disease prevention. Here to protect our hearts and brains is Dr. Patel. Great, good morning, and thank you to the course directors uh, for the invitation to speak with you this morning. Uh, so I get to share the stage with a hematologist, a nephrologist, and now you guys have to listen to a cardiologist. We try to find our way into all conferences. Um, so today uh, I get the pleasure to talk about lipids, and specifically we're going to be focused predominantly on LDL cholesterol as well as triglycerides, because I think that's where most of the data are. Uh, this is a CME event. Uh, this is my disclosure. It's not relevant to this talk. I'm going to be talking about um, the non-branded names of these medications. Um, so these are the guidelines that I use to help guide this talk that's focused on those lipid, uh, specifically LDL cholesterol and triglyceride. And I think uh, this guideline does a nice job in terms of talking about which specific vascular risk factors need to be managed when we talk about the pr uh, primary as well as secondary prevention of strokes, so preventing recurrent strokes. Um, as part of this 360 session that we're talking about. These are some of the vascular risk factors that are highlighted in the guideline, and specifically for this next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about hypercholesterolemia, um, which is defined by an elevated LDL cholesterol, or hypertriglyceridemia, defined by an elevated triglyceride level. So this is a direct uh, screenshot from the guideline. And I focus on this because these are class one level of evidence A recommendations. And I'm not going to uh, read it to you. You can read it here. But I actually very much have to applaud uh, the neurology group, uh, the leaders of these clinical trials who were involved in these stroke trials when it comes to lipid lowering. Because I think from a cardiology perspective, I'm going to show you a, a, a slide that kind of summarizes how we think about lipid lowering in terms of atherosclerotic vascular disease. Uh, but the neurology community and the stroke community actually uh, took the effort to conduct these clinical trials in the right study populations with the right interventions, I thought. And that's what led to these level of evidence A recommendations. So specifically, a torvastatin, 80 milligrams daily is recommended to reduce recurrent strokes in patients um, who don't have coronary heart disease, and that's an important point as well as those with elevated LDL cholesterol. So we may be asking ourselves, well, why are the guidelines endorsing one specific statin? Um, but I'll highlight that here shortly. Um, the other recommendation is, is for patients um, with an ischemic stroke or TIA with atherosclerotic disease, uh, statin with ezetimibe achieving a target LDL cholesterol less than 70 milligrams per deciliter is recommended to reduce recurrent cardiovascular events, and they're very careful on the words that they use in these guidelines, but I've not been in the room, but I can tell you having known what the trials show, they're very particular on the wording they use, and I think it actually meets what the evidence shows. So this is a slide that I show when we talk about um, reducing the risk of recurrent heart attacks as well as recurrent strokes, and that's because strokes, and the, specifically the strokes we're talking about are ischemic strokes. Um, it's a vascular disease, and statins are the first-line therapy. All of these trials that are indicated by the green boxes, the light blue boxes, and the orange boxes were statin trials. This is many clinical trials with thousands of patients. Um, the statin class of agents are one of the most well-studied uh, agents in all of cardiovascular disease, and I suspect um, up there in terms of in regards to classes of agents with antiplatelets when we talk about the stroke literature. Um, in the bottom left, I just have a screenshot of what's considered high intensity, moderate intensity, and low intensity statins. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about high intensity statins because this is predominantly focused on preventing recurrent strokes, and that's a torvastatin 40 milligrams or greater, or rosuvastatin 20 milligrams or greater are considered high intensity statins. Dr. Kagan mentioned uh, the, there may be some controversy about the use of statins in patients undergoing dialysis for reducing vascular events. That's highlighted here by the Aurora trial, which I'm not going to necessarily get into. 
Um, but what I really want to talk about is sparkle. Sparkle or stroke prevention by aggressive reduction in cholesterol levels enrolled over 4,000 individuals who had a recent stroke. So anytime between one to six months after their event, and they had an LDL cholesterol that was elevated in the 100 to 190 milligrams per deciliter range. But the interesting part of this clinical trial was they did not plan to enroll patients who had known coronary heart disease. That was the main um, study population that they wanted to look at. Because on that timeline, those were the patients who were enrolled in clinical trials previously. So Sparkle, which was published in 2006, likely designed several years prior, really wanted to focus on individuals with strokes. These, uh, they, their primary endpoint was also a stroke endpoint. They looked at fatal um, or non-fatal strokes. And so half of these individuals got atorvastatin and then the other half got placebo. Now, uh, there's some details to this trial that are interesting looking back now, almost coming up on 20 years now. Uh, there was some add-on statin during the clinical trial because there were more, more emerging data but essentially, they achieved an LDL cholesterol difference near, of nearly 60 milligrams per deciliter between the placebo and atorvastatin groups, and those are listed there. And we saw a 16% relative risk reduction in stroke with atorvastatin 80 milligrams in this patient population. Now, the interesting uh, finding that was seen here and has not necessarily been replicated consistently but this was one of the first trials that raised some concerns about an increased risk of hemorrhagic strokes with atorvastatin 80 milligrams. Now, I will say that those data have not been consistent in subsequent clinical trials, although there are epidemiologic data to suggest that very low levels of LDL cholesterol may increase the risk for hemorrhagic strokes. That's been seen in other statin trials. Um, but I don't know that the data are consistent enough and perhaps we can discuss more during the question and answer and conversation. Um, subsequently to Sparkle, uh, this uh, trial, uh, the TST or TREAT uh, Stroke to Target trial, I actually think is one of the most important clinical trials um, that we have in cardiology. And the reason for that is, is this was a target uh, trial. This was a strategy trial in individuals who had a stroke or TIA. There are very few strategy trials that we have in medicine in general um, when it comes to vascular risk factors, and this is one of them. Um, there are a lot of limitations to this trial, um, and when we talk about our patients that we're taking care of here in the Houston area, um, first off, disenrolled patients from France and South Korea. They had very recent strokes, and um, they actually had to be enrolled within three months or essentially two weeks of a TIA. Um, the primary endpoint was a composite of many different things, and they randomized these patients to either achieve an LDL uh, cholesterol level less than 70 milligrams per deciliter or a higher target of somewhere between 90 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. And as you can see from these uh, Kaplan-Meier plots, the individuals in red, which is a low target group, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, had about a 22% relative risk reduction in this composite endpoint that included cerebrovascular and uh, coronary heart disease events. So lower LDL cholesterol, we suspect, is better based off of these data, and this was a strategy trial that actually demonstrated that. And then when we look at actual uh, individual endpoints, there was, um, these are just uh, point estimates, but we see that there was a lower risk of stroke here as well. Now, I'm gonna highlight a very, um, a much older, uh, another clinical trial that did not look at statins because it was highlighted in the guidelines, um, specifically azetamibe. That was studied in the Improve It trial. That was a very different study population though. Those were individuals with a recent acute coronary syndrome, very recent, and they either got statin or statin plus azetamibe and they were followed for a very long time. This trial took a very long time uh, to reach the number of total events. They were, this trial enrolled over 18,000 individuals and over, they wanted uh, to see at least 5,000 um, composite endpoints. So this was a very large trial, very long. There was a uh, significant reduction in LDL cholesterol with the addition of azetamibe to simvastatin. And you see that there was a modest uh, uh, six to seven percent relative risk reduction in this 
very large expanded vascular endpoint for cerebrovascular and coronary heart disease. Uh, but there was a reduction, and when we look at stroke specifically, there were numerically fewer stroke events in those who got simvastatin plus azetamide compared with just simvastatin. So now I'm going to move on to uh, what the guidelines gave a 2A recommendation. Um, and I think this is probably very applicable to a large proportion of our patients who have a history of stroke, and we'll talk about why. So these, um, this recommendation specifically talks about individuals with a history of stroke who are considered very high risk and still have elevated LDL cholesterol. We may want to consider something like a PCSK9 inhibitor to prevent recurrent events. So how do you define very high risk? Um, you either have had multiple strokes or multiple atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease events, or you've had a stroke plus a high-risk condition. And when you look at these high-risk conditions, the reality is, is many of our patients are going to fall in this category. Um, age is a very strong risk factor for cerebrovascular disease, and age already gets you, above 65 years gets you into this high-risk category, or hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. So many, many reasons why a patient's going to be considered very high risk, and you may want to consider if their LDL cholesterol is not yet at 70, the addition of something like a PCSK9 inhibitor. There are two uh, large uh, clinical trials looking at two different agents within the class of PCSK9 inhibitors, alirocumab and evolocumab. I'm going to highlight the outcomes trial for evolocumab, which was 4EA, very large clinical trial, over 27,000 patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, about 20% of them had cerebrovascular disease history. Others either had a heart attack or a peripheral arterial disease. And they must have had an LDL cholesterol greater than or equal to 70, which was what led that guideline statement to target that number of LDL cholesterol. And they either got evolocumab or placebo subcutaneous injections and followed them. <coughs> Uh, PCSK9 inhibitors have some of the most dramatic reductions in LDL cholesterol. We can see here um, in this clinical trial nearly a 60% uh, relative reduction in LDL cholesterol. And here is a primary endpoint. After about two to three years, we see a modest 15% relative risk reduction in this composite endpoint that include coronary heart disease with cerebrovascular disease. And then when we look specifically at the stroke reduction, 1.9 versus 1.5 percent strokes in those randomized to evolocumab. So I'm going to go quickly through uh, the triglyceride recommendations. I'll tell you these were updated uh, in the 2021 guideline essentially because of one clinical trial. That clinical trial was called Reduce It, which looked at a specific formulation of a fish oil called icosapent ethyl. Um, the Reduce It trial has a lot of details uh, and a lot of controversy, and I'm just going to highlight that trial briefly. But icosapent ethyl essentially got a 2A recommendation for reducing uh, recurrent strokes or TIAs um, with elevated high triglycerides um, with all of these caveats here. Um, and similarly, even in those who have not had a stroke, icosapent ethyl could be considered, um, and uh, that's based off of the clinical trial Reduce It. So here we go. Uh, reduce It uh, enrolled individuals who either had established cardiovascular cerebrovascular disease or they were a high-risk cohort. So they had diabetes plus some additional risk factor. Um, they had to have elevated triglycerides um, as well as be on good medical therapy, including statins. Then they got randomized to this icosapent ethyl two grams twice a day or placebo. The challenging part of this trial and where the controversy lies is in this placebo group. Um, there's concern that the placebo group may have not actually been an inert placebo and there's potential, for potential contamination in that group, uh, which leads some people to question whether or not it was the icosapent ethyl that led to benefit or the placebo causing harm. I think that's a very debated topic, um, but at the end of the day, uh, these are the data, and we as consumers have to make decisions based off of this. They enrolled over 4,000 individuals in each arm of the trial, looked at a very large composite endpoint that included stroke as well as uh, 
coronary heart disease events. I just want to highlight what the drug did to triglycerides, uh, nearly a 20% uh, reduction in triglycerides and a 6% reduction in LDL cholesterol. Um, a couple of things to highlight here, we saw a very mild increase in LDL cholesterol with the active drug um, with a more modest increase in LDL cholesterol with the comparator placebo. So that raised some suspicion for people um, as well as the change in the high sensitivity CRP. It's a little unusual that this would increase in individuals who got the placebo, raising concerns about it being a true inert placebo. But anyway, the primary endpoint was reduced a relative risk reduction of 25% with icosapent ethyl. That included stroke. When you look at the point estimates for stroke, there was nearly a 1% absolute risk reduction in stroke with icosapent ethyl compared with the placebo in this clinical trial. I'm going to just highlight the, these data from clear outcomes because this was published after the guidelines had been uh, published for stroke. And uh, this is another drug that I think has a good evidence base for consideration when we have patients who are still not achieving their LDL target, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, Bempidoic acid is the drug. This works upstream of statins in the, stat in the uh, cholesterol synthesis pathway. And the benefit of bempidoic acid is reported to be that it is less likely to cause the muscle aches that some of our patients have with statin therapy. And so in clear outcomes, these individuals actually had to have a signed statement essentially saying that they've tried statins, it didn't work for them, the physicians also had to say that as well. And then from there, um, either a high-risk primary prevention or people who have had strokes or other vascular events were randomized to the active drug or placebo and followed. Um, this drug leads to a significant reduction in LDL cholesterol um, as well as some other biomarkers like CRP. Um, but at the end of the day, it reduces the risk for vascular events. Bempidoic acid lowered the risk 13% um, for an expanded vascular event as well as the point estimate for stroke was lower with bempidoic acid. Um, briefly, I just want to highlight now the primary prevention guideline. Many of you are very familiar with these uh, recommendations, but essentially when we talk about primary prevention, so people who have never had a stroke and we're trying to prevent a stroke, uh, individuals with uh, in a couple of categories are recommended statin without even calculating their estimated risk based off of the 10-year pooled cohort equations. Those individuals are those with severe hypercholesterolemia, LDL cholesterol is greater than or equal to 190 milligrams per deciliter. Those with diabetes who are in the age range of 40 to 75, um, they're either uh, recommended a moderate intensity to a high intensity statin. And then it's those individuals where, who don't fall into one of those buckets, they're in their kind of middle-aged life years and their estimated risk based off of those equations estimates to be more than at least 5% uh, we could start thinking about statins. And then if we're not too sure, that's sometimes where we think about some of these other risk assessment tools like lipoprotein A, family history, uh, history of inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, CRP, and then for some individuals, coronary artery calcium score testing can be considered to help guide decision making um, and conversations with our patients regarding statin initiation. So some key takeaways, I think high intensity statin is recommended for the secondary prevention of ischemic strokes when the LDL cholesterol is greater than or equal to 100 milligrams per deciliter. Most of the data are for a torvastatin 80 milligrams once daily but I think um, many would feel comfortable using something like resuvastatin 20 milligrams or higher. Um, if the LDL has not achieved that target with an optimal statin and with ezetimibe, uh, uh, you may wanna continue to try to up titrate uh, the statin dose as you can. And if you're still not able to achieve that LDL cholesterol target, consider things like a PCSK9 inhibitor. And I was, uh, I would say for so very select patients with elevated triglycerides, you may want to have a conversation with your patient about icosapenethyl, considering some of the caveats associated with that. So I thank you for your time, and I look forward to talking with you all.